This video is brought to you by Thrive Market. Well, guys, we did it. It's the year 2022, and we're banning books. Yeah, books, not guns or, uh, or the spread of misinformation or carbon emissions or artificial sweeteners or Kid Rock. We're banning books, including ones considered classics like Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. According to the American Library Association, as of August 2022, there have been some 681 challenges involving some 1,651 books, up from 273 books in 2020 and 566 in 2019. FYI, a challenge is when a person or group requests that a book be removed from a library. Last November, the ALA put out a statement on the topic. In it, they argued that a few organizations have decided that the voices of the marginalized have no place on library shelves. To this end, they have launched campaigns demanding the censorship of books and resources that mirror the lives of those who are gay, queer, or transgender, or that tell the stories of persons who are black, indigenous, or persons of color. Under the guise of calling these books subversive or immoral, the ALA argues, these groups have promoted government censorship by appealing to elected and non-elected officials, and even resorting to intimidation tactics, targeting library workers, educators, and school board members. Everyone will be One of these groups, Florida-based Moms for Liberty, have advocated for the banning of any books that exemplify things like critical race theory. They even offered a $500 reward on information about educators who teach materials which express views associated with CRT. They were also vehemently anti-masking during the peak of the COVID pandemic. So. I guess liberty, a word meaning freedom from government restrictions, has a pretty fluid definitions for these moms. Okay, let's dive into the debate in this Wisecrack edition. Why do we keep banning books? Okay, I wanna take a second and tell you all about this video sponsor, Thrive Market. Now they are an online membership-based grocery store on a mission to make healthy living easy and affordable for everyone. Now I'm sure like many of you, um, I get stressed about the tension between wanting to eat healthy organic foods, but also stick to a budget. And this is where Thrive Market is great, as they can help you save up to 30% on your grocery bill. It's great because it means I don't have to skip buying products I'm really excited about because they're too expensive. For example, I love fancy popcorns, you know, sue me, I love them, but they're really expensive in a lot of stores, but with Thrive, I can be snacking on fancy popcorn every night, so. I'm happy. I know I'm not the only one who struggles to even find the time to shop for healthy groceries and organic products, which for me often involves driving across town in traffic and then praying to the parking lot guides that I can get a spot near the store. But with Thrive Market, I can place my order from work or home and it arrives right at my doorstep. No parking lot arguments are required. And if you're the type of person excited to save money on organic groceries, you're also likely someone who cares about the planet. And lucky for you, Orders of $49 or more are shipped free and with carbon neutral shipping from their zero waste warehouses. So you can save time and money while enjoying high quality organic products while looking out for the planet. So click on the link in the description or go to thrivemarket.com slash wisecrack to place your first order with Thrive today. And when you do, you'll receive a free $60 gift. Options this month include cooking staple sets that come with ingredients and cookbooks, a supplement bundle, and a deluxe travel kit. So head to thrivemarket.com slash wisecrack to save money and eat better today. Now, back to the show. For our purposes, a banned book is a book that has been removed from a public library or a school. A challenged book is one that someone has requested be removed. So this conversation does not include Amazon banning, say, a book that denies the Holocaust. Book banning isn't a new phenomenon. With recent decades seeing bans on children's novels like Bridge to Terabithia and Harry Potter, as well as classics like John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men and Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. Recently, the rise of book banning has targeted works that address topics like race, indigenous people's experiences, and queer narratives. And as we see in groups like Moms for Liberty, anything they can associate with CRT is on the must ban list. If you see this acceptable, you belong on a national registry and not a school board. Oh, and by the way, if you were ever wondering what our take on the critical race theory debate is, uh, we made a video on it. At the same time, librarians are becoming subjects of attack. Kimber Glidden, former Idaho library director, resigned after months of harassment because she feared for her safety. She said, we were being accused of being pedophiles and grooming children. 
people were showing up armed at library board meetings. But book banning has been contentious since long before Americans were bringing guns to library board meetings. What a phrase too that I'm just saying out loud, Americans bringing guns to library board meetings. I'm sure for many of you that just sounds like a normal thing that I just said. What does that mean? You know, what does it, what does it mean? Pause and think about it. Okay, now we're back. According to librarian and author Richard Ovenden, the significance of books and archival material is recognized not only by those who wish to protect knowledge, but also by those who wish to destroy it. He notes that libraries and archives have been targets of attack throughout history, and librarians and archivists have even lost their lives attempting to preserve human knowledge. Book burning first made it to America in 1650, when Massachusetts Puritans seized a pamphlet written by William Pynchon. His crime? Arguing that anyone who was obedient to God and followed his teachings would get into heaven. So I guess the message of this ban was that we need heaven to remain exclusive so people actually want to go there. Like when there's a concert and they tell you it's sold out, but it's not because they're going to release tickets later, but they do that to drive up prices. So I guess the Puritans were the original ticket master. Massachusetts seems to have a particular urge to burn or ban books. Flash forward to the 1920s and you'll find Boston's elite filled watch and ward society mobilized to remove a series of books from libraries and schools. Petitioning libraries, suing booksellers and bringing obscenity charges against authors was among the organization's tactics. And uh, it worked. Between 1927 and 1929, over 60 titles were banned in Boston. The thing most of the banned titles had in common is exemplifying the type of vice that offended both the OG Puritans and the recent Catholic arrivals in the city. Mentions of sex were almost sure to get you banned. The phrase banned in Boston became so ubiquitous that it was even used as a marketing slogan to entice vice-hungry readers to buy supposedly immoral books in other parts of the country. But why were the late 20s such a flashpoint in America's book banning history? As historian Paul Boyer argues, book censorship was a means of reacting to and feeling in control of the changes brought by the turbulent 1920s. The interwar period was a time of rapid change in everything from economics to yes, literature, including lots of what ward members saw as impure literature. And it seems like in trying to control access to ideas, those doing the banning were trying to control where the culture was going. Boston wasn't alone in its censorship-happy elite societies. During the Jim Crow era, the Daughters of the Confederacy successfully pushed for bans of textbooks that did not paint a sympathetic narrative of the South in the Civil War. Historian Karen Cox explains that the importance the Daughters placed on historical work cannot be overstated because they acted on the assumption that duty required them to defend the honor of Confederate men and women. This meant instilling young people in the South with respect for the Confederate past and its principles. For the daughters, books, especially historical scholarship and historical memory, were, according to Cox, a powerful tool of persuasion. Beyond controlling historical narratives, book banning and burnings have also historically functioned to silence and even erase ideas seen as dangerous by those in power. The most glaring example occurred in Nazi Germany. On May 10th, 1933, a crowd of almost 40,000 students gathered around a bonfire outside the Humboldt University of Berlin. They cheered as someone threw a bust of Jewish intellectual Magnus Hirschfeld into the fire. Hirschfeld founded the Institute of Sexual Science, which housed scholarship on the study of sex, sexuality, and gender, with a focus on promoting the rights of those who didn't conform to established norms. The crowd then threw thousands of volumes from the Institute's library into the fire, along with other books by Jewish authors and anyone they considered to be un-German. Hitler's top propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, praised this destruction of decadence and moral corruption as a strong, great, and symbolic deed. It was none of these things, and it was good when Goebbels died. This suggests that book burning has long been as much a powerful symbol as it has been a practical way to prevent those seeking certain types of knowledge from acquiring it. And while he famously didn't write books, we see this type of reaction against new ideas all the way back in Plato's account of the trial of Socrates, where he was sentenced to death for exposing the young people of Athens to ideas that challenged dominant modes of power. While book censorship has been around for a long time, the charges themselves have remained fairly consistent. These books instill young people with the wrong values and thus undermine social order. Ironically though, banning a book often serves the opposite purpose. Historically, there's been no better way to make a book fly off the shelves 
than to ban it. It's why first editions of OJ Simpson's If I Did It are going for almost $1,000 on eBay. That's true if you're talking about a very dull, graph-heavy 1857 book penned by a South Carolinian arguing against the economics, but not the morality of chattel slavery. It's also true if you're talking about a 1980s breakthrough graphic novel, Mouse, depicting the experiences of the author's parents in the German concentration camp Auschwitz. After being banned last year in a small Tennessee town, Mouse quickly became an Amazon bestseller. These days, the justification that some organizations and library board enthusiasts use to challenge and or ban books have retained a similar flavor. Specifically, they tend to fall into two camps. One, books that contain sexual content or the suggestion of sexual difference, and two, books that portray U.S. history, particularly its history of enslavement and occupation in ways that might undermine patriotism. These days, the second camp is largely using a fear-mongering interpretation of critical race theory to justify their attempts to ban books and punish teachers. Pen America, an organization that advocates for the freedom of expression, assembled an index of school book bans to track trends about which books have been targeted over a recent nine-month period. The results were instructive. 41% had protagonists or prominent secondary characters of color, and 22% directly addressed race and racism. A third of books explicitly addressed queer themes or had queer protagonists. One quarter contained sexual content ranging from sexual encounters to information about puberty, sex, or relationships. And 25% were history books, biographies, or featured themes about rights and activism. This suggests that a lot of book banning today is about censoring experiences that fall outside of white heterosexual norms. I want all of the norms that I follow to be those that Jerry Seinfeld experiences. Nowhere is this more true than in prison, where book review committees decide which books incarcerated people are allowed access to. Jessica Phoenix Sylvia, a formerly incarcerated trans woman of color and writer, has detailed how the carceral system has been restricting access to ideas by banning certain topics or books from prison libraries, even when prisoners bought those books themselves. Sylvia argues books can change lives. France Fanon's Wretched of the Earth is one book that changed my life. Fanon says, we must elevate the people, expand their minds, equip them, differentiate them, and humanize them. To do this, we must access ideas and language through literature. I resist the dehumanization that prisons create, which is further maintained by unjust censorship. Here's an unfun fact for you. The Michigan State Prison System has banned Fanon's work from their libraries. But this recent wave of censorship has not gone unnoticed, and librarians have been mounting their counteroffensive, which while forceful, is also very quiet and respectful. When their workers aren't busy penning screeds against censorship, some libraries have been lending out books to non-residents as a way of broadening access. The Brooklyn Public Library has an unbanned books program, which provides ebook access to people in places where book banning is prominent, like Oklahoma, by using QR codes. Other technology, like the Internet Archive, can counter attempts to make books banned in schools and libraries unavailable. Or as a Washington Post headline put it, you can ban a book, but can you stop teens from finding it online? Another encouraging sign is the attention that book banning has been receiving in the media in recent months. But hey, at least we've moved past actually burning books. Mom, let me throw some books. Okay, maybe not. Moving on. Still, the ALA has found that about 82 to 97% of complaints seeking to ban books continue to go unreported. Under these conditions, spreading information about those quiet but effective attempts to remove books from the shelves can go a long way in raising awareness. But as we survey the current rise of book banning in America, it's worth taking a step back and asking, why all the panic about books? According to scholar Emily Knox, book censorship highlights an intimate relationship between power and knowledge. Kind of like we mentioned earlier regarding the death of Socrates, right? Because he got killed because the knowledge he was encouraging threatened the positions of those in power. So he had to get God. She explains, when a group or individual endeavors to remove, restrict, or relocate an item within a public institution, they are both demonstrating their concern over the knowledge contained within the book and also exercising their symbolic power over the institution. In building her argument, Knox draws on Pierre Bourdieu to assert that challengers use symbolic power as citizens, parents, or taxpayers to shape public institutions in their community. She states that symbolic power is important because it is often misrecognized as something else, such as common sense or justified actions. I.e., if the library or school board banned a book by Toni Morrison, then, well, she must be dangerous. Bourdieu defines symbolic power as those symbolic instruments, including discourse, that are used by one social group to dominate another social group. And according to Knox, censorship also highlights a struggle for domination over who has the authority to determine the boundaries of legitimate and illegitimate knowledge in the public's 
sphere. That is to say, when the lived experiences of an indigenous American child growing up on a reservation aren't considered legitimate knowledge, the age-old domination of white Americans over indigenous people only becomes more deeply entrenched, and their exclusion from many facets of American society are only reinforced. That's because books, like all cultural artifacts, play a vital role in helping us construct a sense of who we are. Not least of which, when the ideas they contain are reinforced by authority figures, i.e. teachers. French philosopher Louis Althusser explains this via his theory of interpolation, which argues that our ideas about a given topic are not something we arrive at on our own, but rather are internalized and accepted on the basis of what's been presented to us by our culture. And in turn, these ideas shape our subject activities. This is all encouraged by what Althusser called ideological state apparatuses, or ISAs, which are things like churches, families, and schools that reinforce these modes of subjectivity. An example of interpolation is our association of pink with young girls and blue with young boys. Now, this wasn't always the case. Back in 1918, a trade publication, Earnshaw's Infants Department, hopefully explained that the generally accepted rule is pink for the boys and blue for the girls. Anyway, today's reigning assumption that the pink-blue girl-boy dichotomy is inherent to toddler's supposed natural color preferences exposes the extent to which we internalize cultural expectations. Okay, but back to books. The knowledge within their text are crucial to the process of interpolation, i.e. the formation of subjectivity. They are a vital way we internalize ideas about our culture, and they create subjects who in turn perpetuate certain ideas and cultural norms. And as norms surrounding racial and indigenous identities, sexual and gender identities, and so on continue to shift, they're going to remain flashpoints for folks who would rather these new notions not be internalized by future generations. Basically, groups like Moms for Liberty and people like Christopher Rufo know that controlling the ideas in places like schools and libraries allows them to use these ideological state apparatuses to help create subjects that serve their ideological aims. It's like a sick version of my plan to make my future children listen to music I like from a young age, so when they get older, I'll always have concert buddies to encourage my own interest. And they'll have a concert buddy who's old enough to buy them booze. Because ultimately, the matter of books does doesn't just have to do with broader institutional power over what information children can access. It has a lot to do with parents specifically, those who are seeking to limit that access to their children. As Emily Knox explains, people are trying to get books like Mouse Band because they are afraid that if their children read them, they will have different values than the values their parents want them to have. That's really what this is about. People are looking to books as dangerous knowledge. And in a democracy where our education system is intended to produce well-informed citizens who can weigh multiple opposing opinions in order to determine which one they think is best and maybe even do a better job at it than their parents before them. This all seems pretty bleak. But hey, we'll always have the internet, right? That you, um, you had, you, you, you could, you do, you wait. What do you guys think? Let us know in the comments. And also let us know in the comments what your favorite banned book is. A special thanks to all our patrons. If you haven't checked out our Patreon page in a while, please do because it's the best way for you to directly support the work that we're doing here on the channel. And you get some great perks as well, like extra content and early videos. And thanks again to Thrive Market for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to go to thrivemarket.com slash wisecrack to make your first order and get your free $60 gift today. As always, thank you so much for watching, and we'll catch you later.